again. Welcome to One More Thing Podcast. Good morning. Good morning. We are closing out transitions, man. What a great series this was. It's been fun. It was so eye-opening. I mean, the way you you take these stories, right? Because that's you know, that's what they are. They're right. stories, right? There's not a whole lot of archaeological, anthropological evidence that these actually took place. But man, the principles that we're able to extract from those things, like when, so I'll get to the, to the sermon in a bit, but when you're, when you're studying Dr. Bach and give some of the people like an insight, like when you are reading these old ancient stories from bronze aged men who wrote these things, like what's your methodology? What's your method to say, what, what can I glean from this? What can I extract from this? Like, how do you prepare to say, I know that these stories aren't necessarily literally or even mm-hmm. historically true. Right. We're not saying they're not. We just don't know. So how do you, how do you as a, a pastor approach that? Well, um, part of the thing, I, I go back and ask the very basic questions. Who said it to whom? What was the situation? What was the circumstance? What was the culture at that day? Mm-hmm. And try to immerse yourself in the culture right. of, of what these stories, uh, how these stories could impact us. Also to understand why are they here, mm-hmm. and and when you start there saying what is the truth? I mean, if I were to back a dump truck up to Siesta Beach, and and someone said there are diamonds in here, and you go okay, there's a there's a certain area of the beach where their diamonds are hidden. Right. Well, we start ex- excavating, and we we get dump truck after dump truck of sand, but at the end of the day, there's only a few diamonds. <laughs> Do you really need to pull all the sand off the beach? <laughs> Sometimes we take a lot of sand with us into the 21st century that mm-hmm. needs to be left on the beach. There you go. That's and great. And our job is to is to sift through the sand while it's there, and and maybe you don't need a dump truck. Maybe you just need a small case. That's right. And you right. put the diamonds in the case, and you come back, and you let them sparkle and let them uh, do their thing to the contemporary audience. So that, that's what we try to do is find out what those nuggets of truth are back there. Because I think humanity yeah. is really not that much different today than it was, you know, two to four thousand years ago. And the reason these principles have sustained themselves so long because there are principles in there. That's right. If if I were a, a Jewish rabbi, I'd look at these stories as stories and what are the truths within them mm-hmm. instead of trying to say, oh well, you know, so many thousand of this or exactly how many days or yeah. and and we get caught up in the weeds. Yeah. And that's where you got to sift through them a little better. So what do you think? Because you and I have both been accused of certain things, um, like you said yesterday in the sermon, like people, have, uh, Dr. Bauckham doesn't believe in Jesus. Right. And you go, I think I do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bauckham doesn't believe in the Bible. I think I do. At, what is the fear that people experience from your, your, from your own experience in pastoring people and leading people to this this, what we call this new direction in right. Christianity. What 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 fear do they have in letting go of the sand and holding on to the diamonds? I think, well, some people, for example, if I come from Catholicism, mm-hmm. I look through a certain lens. If I'm Lutheran or if I'm a Presbyterian or if I come from the, the, the charismatic strain, right. we, we all come with this heritage of who we are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and when we let that determine our objectivity... Mm. There's a problem. And uh, sometimes we just keep repeating it because we think it'll be true if we just keep repeating it. But moving beyond folk theology, mm-hmm. folk theology is just grassroots. Yes. And what we struggle with today, and give you an example, not to throw uh, stones at anyone, but a lot of the guys are on TV, whether it's uh, Charles Stanley or who's not on there anymore and passed away, but right. David Jeremiah is a great guy, yeah. Joel Osteen, you know, these guys, very popular. It used to be Bill Hybels and Willow Creek, and, mm-hmm. and you had Rick Warren and Saddleback, and these guys are, are on the airwaves, and some of what they teach may or not, may not be the best theological stuff, but when the local people, they begin to base their theology, sometimes not based on good academic study, based on stories that I hear on TV. Mm-hmm. And we have to be the guys that say, you know, that yeah. uh, that guy's probably not the most accurate. Yeah. Now, I'm very, very careful here. Let me use Joel Osteen as an example. I think Joel Osteen's doing the best that he can with what he knows. Yes. And we shouldn't throw stones. I think he's doing great work. Mm-hmm. Does that mean he's the most theologically accurate? Probably not. 
But it doesn't mean he's not doing the best he can with what he has. Right. And uh, and let's talk about my mother. I love to talk about her. She's 97 and a half years old, and she teaches a Bible study on Thursdays. And I talk to her about sometimes, hey, think about what about this? What about this? You know, yeah. try to give her a few nuggets of truth that make her life easier. Right. And she does not uh, appreciate those. <laughs> but here's what I, I do notice is that she's doing the best she can with what she's got. Yes. And who am I to go to a 97-year-old woman and say, ah, your theology is screwed up. You're saying that wrong. That was disproved a long time ago. Right. Or that's one of 10 different viewpoints, and you're choosing the most conservative that most people don't even adhere to that. Right. So for people who are doing the best they can with what they know, we need to provide a lot of grace mm-hmm. and also a lot of, hey, keep going. I'd rather you get up there and try to love people and bring them into community. And even if your theology is slightly off kilter, yeah, I think our job is not to say they're wrong or bad, but simply say, hey, keep going. Yeah. On the other hand, I wish they'd give me the same grace. Yeah, yeah. Because sometimes if I don't believe in a literalism or, you know, if I don't define hell exactly the way it's been defined traditionally or Jesus, you know, I have, you know, do I think Jesus was a historic figure? Of course. And I have strong feelings about being a Christ follower. Right. But but if I don't fit into their mold. That's right. It's problematic. And if you're Presbyterian, it's one way. If you're yeah. Baptist, it's kind of this way. If you're Methodist or, you know, I grew up Nazarene. Yeah. Everybody has their different way. But how do we uh, how do we love everyone at the same time and still proclaim what we think should yeah. be? And that's the balancing act that we've always done at Suncoast from day one. It's to not disparage others. That's right. We're not better than you are. But here's the thing. When we can help people grow, when the tide goes up, Mm-hmm. All the boats are lifted. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would just appreciate not being shot at. Yeah. I mean, it's been a while since I've really taken a few shots. But, right. But I've had plenty of holes in me from those shots. <laughs> but but we still try to be honest. That's it. Uh, and here's the thing that people may or may not know. When I was a pastor in a certain church, you know, I was subservient to a board. Mm-hmm. So I had 10 people on the board, and they could fire me. Yeah. So, and often the people who are on the board were the people with the most money. That's right. And, you know, you can't take the, the chance of losing numbers of people or number of finance. Mm-hmm. So without really you – know, so are you really uh, subservient to them? Yes. Could you – are you careful what you say so you can keep your job? Yes. Yes. And pastors are doing that all over the country. Mm-hmm. At Suncoast, we're in a unique situation to where we have a facility that – is not run by a board per se. I have a board of advisors Mm -hmm. and they advise me. They're friends who want to help me be at my best, Mm -hmm. but they can't fire me. Right. Uh, And uh, I mean, unless I just really did a couple things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but they could, if I, if I were, you know, sexually, you know, left my wife or something else, they could look at me. Secondly, if I embezzled funds. Yeah. So there's a couple of criteria, but beyond that, they let me be the best person I can. But the money people, since we have a school that rents from us and, and pays a lot of our our mortgage and utilities, we have more liberty that n- no one financially owns us here. Mm-hmm. We truly have what is considered academic freedom. We have biblically academic freedom to teach what we think is the right thing to That's teach. Right. And we don't soften the blow. We don't, we don't cave into those who have money who may have a more conservative viewpoint than we do. Mm-hmm. We, we try to be... And we're free to yeah. be as honest as possible. It's liberating. That's once it. you get that, once you get out of that box, whew, I can never imagine going yeah. back. But it does take your transition. I mean, it takes in the series of transitions. What was so brilliant about it was we're all in different sort of paradigms of transitioning. Mm-hmm. Some of us are transitioning to that more. I, I don't use the word progressive politically, but theologically. Like right. we're, we're we're becoming aware. Right. To the truth of what this text is and the historical cultural situations. And many people are completely unaware. And that's where scholars like yourself and I come in and we go, well, here's the context of this thing. And I love what Aristotle said. Aristotle said once he goes, man, it, you know, a ship is safest in the harbor, but that's not what a ship is made for. Mm. And we're safe if we play just by, well, this is what the history and tradition and doctrine right. is taught. But I think that's the transition that Suncoast has gone through is 
now we're 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 a ship outside of the harbor and we're able to explore the nuances and the truth of this text and every day what you said yesterday was so powerful every day i wake up with the same mentality i say take the rocks out yeah take because there's something's going to be said online i'm going to disagree with i'm going to like vehemently disagree right with some of my friends who post all these bible verses and they they try to interpret it through a very very you know conservative lens and but you just smile breathe in you breathe out you smile and mm-hmm. you go man i'll say a little prayer that someone comes along who's brave and will help them make that transition because you're right i think that the element we look for here is freedom and it's not a freedom to just be have a license to do whatever the heck you want to do and right. be immoral because you don't believe in that sort of idea of hell but it's a freedom that goes I want to tell everyone I know about this love of God that I awaken to it and it changes me from the inside out. And that's the kind of freedom we're wanting to, I think, accomplish here. But some people can't grasp that. For example, I talked to someone and they said, well, if there's not a hell, then why should I live a good life? Good question. Yeah. Had another guy say, you need to have a board over you that you're accountable to, that you're subservient to. Because if you don't, then you will go down a road to where you, you lose integrity. And I asked the same guy, so, so let me get this right. So let's talk about my marriage. So unless I have someone who's on the board overseeing my marriage, then I'm going to commit sexual sin. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commit adultery with other women. No, it's my heart for my wife. That's right. It's my heart for her that maintains the relationship. And it's my heart for God that maintains the relationship. Mm-hmm. But it's not the fear or the oversight or the, you know, the, the fear of hell, the oversight of others that keeps you on the straight path. It's called integrity. That's right. It's called doing the right thing because it is the right thing. It's, it's called Christ-like living. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we aspire to. And you know, none of us are you know, perfect in what we do. Let's be very clear. That's right. That's but right. we can sure get up and try. Yeah, we could sure get up and empty our pockets and say, "Today I'm going to be a better version than I was yesterday." That's and, right. Uh, and if you start doing a inventory on your life every day, there's some issues every day. Yeah, they go, "Oh man, should I can do that better?" Yeah, I shouldn't have said that. It sounded such. I was so arrogant there, or I was not courteous, or maybe I should have been more kind. Maybe I sh- think through. You know, I, I walked in that door and I should have stopped and held the door. Mm-hmm. Or just whatever it is. That's and right. And they're small things, but you realize it in those moments. Of, That's hey, right. You know, I, I just, I want to be better than who I am. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's because this presence of Christ within, the, this is my aspiration. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, that's who we are. And so I want to ask you this as the last question, because the series that, you know, I've, I've gotten to teach some, and but sitting under your leadership, I learn a lot. And it gets my mind going. And I think that's that's how I think the spirit mm-hmm. of God works. I agree. It's something is revealed to us and you know, in, in academics we call it we analyze and then we synthesize the information. Mm-hmm. That's why it's good to read lots and lots of books because those things come back to you. So after one of your sermons a couple of weeks ago, I wrote something on my 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 Facebook post and it it got a lot of traction, not necessarily positive traction, mm-hmm. but I, I want your response to it because it's transitions. I wrote, killing your enemies is biblical. Loving your enemies is biblical, but only one of these is Christ-like. Owning a slave is biblical. Setting slaves free is biblical, but only one of these is Christ-like. Mm-hmm. Beware of knowing one and not the other. Like, how would you? That's, I love it. I think that's that's absolutely accurate. You say, well, because those are biblical things, yeah. slavery, and uh, I mean, that's very much was practiced in the biblical times. And thou shalt not kill, but there's lots of Old Testament stories where, you know, you kill 3,000 people, right. you know, for <laughs> worshiping the golden calf. Golden calf, yeah. And just wipe them out. But which ones of those are Christ-like? And I think that's when Jesus came. And he said, you know, you've heard that it was said, mm-hmm. but I tell you. You've heard the Bible was this, yeah. but I tell you there's something more. Mm-hmm. It can't be just this literal thing. There's right. a there's a, a meaning and a fulfillment. And, and as I read the Old Testament, I, I really believe that 
when they wrote it, they put a lot of words in God's mouth. Yeah. These stories are written many, many years later, hundreds, thousands of years later. And, and God was responsible for the rain and babies to be born. And, you know, right. so God was responsible for everything. So everything happened, whether well, there's a war, well, God's responsible. We won, God's responsible. We lost, God's responsible. That's right. Uh, but at some point you go back and say, okay, we have to, we have to bring the diamonds mm-hmm. from the beach and leave the sand there. Yeah. And a lot of that uh, culturally laden stuff is stories, details of stories. And if we're not careful, we can miss there are great truths in the Old Testament that Jesus would say, yep, That's you got right. it. You got it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Those are the good things. That's right. This other stuff, that's what it says, but I tell you. And I think it's just a its a way of growing and transitioning to a better form of understanding. Yeah. And that's what we try to teach here. That's what you try to teach. It's yeah. what I try to teach. And that's why we're here together. That's it, You know, man. trying to make a difference. It's a privilege. So. We're getting ready for Easter. Last yes, we week. are. We're transitioning. So we're three weeks away from Palm Sunday. So I get I get to be up the next three weeks with a series called Triggered. And just I think, you know, I talked to you about it and you were like, hey, let's go with it. Because it is the journey of Jesus mm-hmm. towards Palm Sunday. And then, of course, is the crucifixion and the day of resurrection. But it's going to be, an, I think it's going to be a powerful, very powerful series. And, man, it's coming off the heels of transition and We're calling it Triggered, and three things that Jesus does before entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday that triggers not just the religious minds, Mm -hmm. but he triggers people who you would think are actually following him and by what he's doing. So it's going to be a really, really awesome series. I am looking forward to it. Can't wait. It'll be fun. So thank you so much for working on that. Yeah. I'll be your biggest supporter. Let's go. Thanks, Dr. Baca. Pleasure.